This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean and by Ting. Go to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device or your first month of service. Welcome to the Linux Action Show, episode 325. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Good morning to you, Matt. Good morning. Are you ready for me to tell folks about the big show today? Big time. All right, well, coming up on this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, finally, finally, we'll show you how to safely replace TrueCrypt with utilities built into Linux that you can trust, wrapped around some easy-to-use utilities with some nice, powerful features. So that'll be coming up in the second half of the show. I felt a lot like uh, viewer of the show, Mike Doherty. He tweeted just last night, current status. Hmm. Oh, God. Oh, God. (laughs) How do I or how do I do that LVM Lux dance again? And why isn't this easier? I just need to replace TrueCrypt. Oh no, kidding! And uh, I've got. A, let me tell you. So I'm attacking this from my need, okay. and I don't know. This may not apply to everyone. It probably won't. There's a lot of there's a lot of ways to do this under Linux, and I wanted something that will work in my use case. So I, on occasion, am sent things for our show unfiltered mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. are not. Probably not a good idea to leave sitting around on an unencrypted file system. Sure. And I need something that, you know, if I'm out on the road doing these shows, if we go to OSCON, I need something that's portable that I can actually use. So I need something. One of the things, so TrueCrypt could do a lot of things. TrueCrypt could encrypt a whole partition. TrueCrypt right. could encrypt a drive. Or it could just do a file. And then you would mount that file as a drive, write to it, and then close it off. That's oh. what works for me because I like having a file on my laptop. It's not the best situation, but for me, from a practical standpoint, it's something I always have with me. I can throw it in my own cloud or Dropbox sure. or BitTorrent Sync. And it's it's essentially a volume I mount on demand. I save what I need into it, and then I close it out. I like that. I like that. You know, because then you're not you're not leaving it's wide open when it doesn't need to be. Right. There's no sense in that. And and you could also do like an encrypted um, thumb drive, for example. Sure. Oh, the problem yeah. is, is maybe I forget to bring that with me, or you lose it. And you just, lose then it. Then you lose all your files. It, mm-hmm. it the, or the drive wears out. That happens right. with thumb drives as well. And I need to be in a situation where I've gotten an email. I need to remove this email immediately and save it to my file system immediately, and I need that to be a protected process, and I need to be able to do it wherever I'm at, so that way it can be done as fast as possible. So straightforward pipeline. So mm. this is where Tomb comes in. Tomb mm. is the crypto underta- undertaker, as they call themselves. Like it's that. 100% open source. Its whole goal is to make strong encryption super easy to use. It's like a locked folder that can be safely transported and hidden in your file system. Keys can be kept separate, too, so you could have a key on your USB stick. Oh, yeah. And there's some other solutions I'll tell you about for your keys. And it's, so it's a key and a file-based system, and I really, really like it. One of the things I like about Tomb, and I went through like a list of things I wanted to have in my encryption software. Right. All dependencies of Tomb are pretty much just common Linux components. Almost every Linux system by default has everything you require to use Tomb installed by default. If it's not, nice. I have all the files you do depend on. And almost guaranteed those files are in your repo. It's things like GPG, you know, Mm -hmm. like real Mm -hmm. straightforward stuff. Uh, It uses DMCrypt for the block-level encryption. DMCrypt is built right into the Linux kernel. It's something I respect a lot. DMCrypt is an enabling technology. It can encrypt full devices. It can also encrypt loopback devices. It can, uh, it can, it it is really, it's been around since about 2004, and it's really impressive. And on top of DMCrypt, Tomb is using Lux. Lux is a disk encryption created in 2004, written specifically for for Linux, its disk encryption is implemented different. It's not, it's not, um, I mean, I'm sorry, it's not like a weird uh, proprietary encryption. Right. It's very standard. It's something that oh, you could use good. on any Linux box that has anything newer than the Linux 2.6 kernel. Well, that's so pretty reasonable. So it makes reasonable. it super universal, yeah. right? So everything's built into Linux. It's using industry standard technologies. It's been in the kernel since 2.6. Portability is there. Okay. I like that. I like it. So, so far. this is why, so far for me, Tomb was really awesome. And uh, I have the instructions on how you install Tomb in your distro. It's very straightforward. First, grab the uh, dependencies, things like ZSH, uh, GNU PG, and a few other optional dependencies that I've included in the show notes. And then you just make install. And it, it you just download the targ, you extract the targ z, make install, it'll put it in your user local directory, really easy. Nice. If you are an Arch user, it's already in the Arch user repo, so you can just pull it down. It's Tomb, T-O-M. 
T-O-M-B from the Arch user repository. So that it's really straightforward to get installed. Very cool. And do you have to also, for Arch users, do you have to pull down the dependencies as well, or is that just automatically uh, there's, taken care It'll of pull down everything you need except for one thing, and I'll okay. tell you about that in a second cool. um, as we get to that. So once you have it installed, and I'm not going to walk you through the install because the install is it's, it's oh, straightforward yeah. as installing as You're building, gets. yeah. Yeah, it's make install if you don't have it in your repo. Once you have Tomb installed, you drop to the command line and become root. This is, if I'm going to put, by the way, I have a cons category. You got to do a lot of stuff as root. You could potentially consider that a con. But let me show you in Tomb how you create a secure Tomb. Yeah, they're, they're called tombs. They're really just files. I love that. Yeah. They're loopback files, really. So I have all the commands in the show notes. You guys can follow along if you want. But you start with the, with the dig commands. You type in tomb dig. And then you tell it, uh, here you can see my command right here, S-S dash S is the size. Okay. I'm going to make it, a, you have to, it has to be a minimum of 10 megabytes, but it could be as large as you want. You can also grow tombs, but you oh, cannot really? shrink tombs. Interesting. That's good to know. That's good to know. Uh, so then you name your you name your tomb. I'm naming mine secret.tomb. And then you see how I did this dash F? Yeah. If I don't do the dash F... I, it, uh, the operation of ports here, and uh, this oh. is this is kind of neat. It shows you they're they're really looking at this stuff. What Tomb says, it comes back and says, "Sorry, bro, an active swap partition has been detected. This poses a possible security risk. What I recommend you do: turn off your swap." Oh no, kidding! Because the idea is, contents of memory could be written to the swap right. file. Someone could analyze your swap file and potentially pick out something like the key or That's a password. A lot of non-forensics people don't know that, right? So, but I don't care because no. this is just for demonstration right, sure. purposes. So you can do dash f. And if you don't care, you can do dash F. But it gives you the command to just turn your swap file off for a few minutes. Okay. Not and then deal. dash F does what instead of then? It says, hey, I don't care about my swap. Force oh, that. Okay. Force the matter. Force it. So you create it right there. And uh, it says, of course, in fact, let me, uh, I already made it because I was making one earlier. Yeah. So yeah. Boom. Uh, it goes and creates it. It takes a second. The the uh, the smaller it is, the faster it goes. Okay. And you can say here it's done digging. My tomb is not ready yet. I now need to forge my key and lock my tomb. I love this. It's almost like you get to play a game while you're building your right. tomb. Right. And look, it cool. gives me the next commands I need to type word for word right here. Oh, so that's great. There's no ambiguity. I, I have them all in the show notes, right. but there's no mystery. It's right there. Now, here's the part that takes a long time. Generating the key, depending on how fast your machine, could sure. take two minutes. It could take 20 minutes. It so, you know, whether you're going really Pentium 3 or you're going i7, you yeah. know, kind of depending where you're Pretty at much. here. You know. So that's the forging process yeah. because that is, it's using entropy in your computer to generate random numbers, and it yeah. needs a certain amount of random numbers before it will proceed. So I went ahead and already created my key, so that way we weren't sitting here for right. five minutes. The Bonobo actually busts it out pretty quick. But once you have your key, you create your key, you now need to lock your tomb with that key. So right now, we just have an empty tomb that's not password protected. It's not Got encrypted. It. When we go tomb lock, we tell it, you here we say, generate a key. Mm-hmm. Or, or, I'm sorry, I generate a key. I'm doing dash K. This says, use the key I generated. Apply this key to the secret tomb. Okay. So I gave it the tomb name. When I hit enter, it comes up. If you're on the GTK desktop, it'll ask you for the password that you created when you made the key. So I go ahead and I put in the password. It's now formatting the device in extend or the uh, secret tomb in extended four. It's co- it's it's encrypting it with Lux. Wow. And now my tomb is ready. My secret dot tomb is now secured with that wow. key file. Now you can only open that tomb now using that key file. So let me show you how you do that. And for anyone that might be confused, uh, it almost looks like GNOME keyring just kicking up its usual. You know, I want, yeah, they have. If you're not on, if you're not yeah. on GNOME, they'll just prompt the password right. to the command line. Okay. So now you tell Tomb open. I give it the file name of the tomb I want opened. Okay. I give it the key that I'm going to use to open the tomb. And because I have my swap file active, I'm telling it to force. There's, there's the commands. It, right interesting there. thing I noticed here is not only are you using, um, you know, you're using open versus lock, but you're also reversing the order of yeah. the tomb and the key. Right. So. Because before you were locking the right. tomb with that key. So now you're opening the tomb. So I'm saying, open this tomb, use this key. Right. So I hit enter. It now asks me for the password because okay. this is what the key is encrypted with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I give it the password, super secret, super secure. It now mounts that tomb at media slash secret dot tomb. Oh, so if we nice. look at mount, I now have that tomb mounted as a drive. So oh, it's right there. Loop yeah. Zero. So we could open up like, uh, here, let's go to Nautilus. Yeah. And we can go in here, and you can see right there, there's secret. Now, the problem is, is I don't have right access, because sure. we just did everything as root. Yep. So that'll be the first thing you hit when you do that. But that's super easy to fix. Just do a chown, change owner, mm-hmm. Chris F., right? And I'll go media, secret. And now I've just made that secret tomb owned by Chris, and now, now I can go in here, and I can create files uh, in uh, Nautilus in my secret tomb now that I have access to it. Yep. 
So uh, that is it. So there's a few problems. And now, now when I'm done with my secret, I've made my secret folder in my encrypted tomb file. This is my encrypted volume. Now I just go tomb and close. And tomb will close all mounted encrypted volumes. Oh, nice. So basically from a visual perspective and also from a security perspective, it's all, it vanishes. Yeah. You, there's no trace. So you can see there it says your bones mm. will now rest in peace. I love that. And, I uh, love that. And cool. my, my tomb is no longer mounted. There's a couple of problems I have with this. Number one, the key sitting here on the file system. So uh, we got we to yeah. clear that up. Yeah. Number two, it's pretty obvious that secret.tomb is where all my goodies lie, right? <laughs> right? That's pretty obvious. Right, right, right. So let me show you how you, if you were actually going to use this in production, here's how I would do it. Okay. Okay. This uh, is helpful. I would, I would, I, I would use, yes, it's a little bit of security through obscurity and a little, and, um, but again, this what I'm trying to go for here is if you really wanted security with Tomb, you'd probably store that key on like a separate USB device. Oh, absolutely. You would not keep it on the computer. Right. That, that's, no. And you definitely wouldn't keep it in the cloud. No, yeah. By any yeah, stretch. Yeah, yeah don't put it in your Dropbox. Don't do that kind yeah. of stuff. Here's the thing, though, is I'm trying to strike a balance between ultimate portab portability where everything right. is on my Bonobo, but yet still have a reasonable amount of security. And I think to do that... I have to A, acknowledge it's a bit of a compromise, and B, you do have to employ a little bit of misdirection. So here's what I did. <laughs> I created a Windows 7 virtual machine oh. in my slash opt. So here okay. I am. I'm in, uh, I'm in slash opt slash VMs slash Win7. Right. Okay. In here is a Win7 virtual box machine. It's actually just totally a blank VDI. Right, but for the purposes of demonstration, yeah, sure. I have a two gigabyte VDI. Then I have three 27 megabyte VDI images. One of these is a tomb. Oh, that's brilliant! Cause right? Because if you're if you're glancing over this in a casual, non-heavy forensic sort of way, you're not you're just going to gloss yeah. right over it. Be that's like, okay. my thinking, and I, I intentionally yeah. I intentionally created a multiple disks and stashed it in there. Right. But here's another part that's super cool. If you install the pa the package stag hide s t e g hide yeah when you install uh, tomb. Stagger. Tomb can actually hide the key in a JPEG file using steganography. Oh, my God. That's... So you don't have to have the file sitting around the file system. It's that embedded in a JPEG. It is James Bond action. Right. So you can see here, wow. I don't have a key. So let me show you how I could extract that key and restore this virtual tomb wow. that's not actually a VDI. So I'll, I'll demonstrate that now. So uh, I've already done the uh, tomb bury command, but tomb, okay. if you have stag hide installed, Tomb has a bury command, and you say, Tomb, take the key I've generated mm -hmm. and bury it into this JPEG image. And then it buries that key into the JPEG image using steganography, and then you just delete the file. off. So you, don't, so you still have the JPEG. Right. So now what I have is I have this VDI – well, it's not a VDI image, but it yeah. looks like a VDI image. And somewhere else on my file system, I have a completely – innocent looking jpeg file that only i know is actually the key to this file and That's it's just awesome. in my pictures directory with all the hundreds of other background pictures i have and, and make sure the pictures are just completely mundane as yeah. possible There's lots of pictures of like yeah, family fact, vacation would be i'll show perfect. you here's the picture so yeah. uh i think i can pull it up right here if we go i, yeah. I put it here in my documents folder and uh, just to make it easy for the purposes of demonstration i called it golf.jpg so here's golf.jpg. This JPEG actually has my tomb key embedded oh, into man. it. You can That's look at this great. freaking file oh, yeah. and you'd have no idea there's no. a hidden key in there, right? No. How I love would it. you? I, mean, I love yeah. it. So let's go, uh, let's go <laughs> see if we can cool. mount this. So we'll do uh, – so first we have to pull out our key. So we, uh, I have all this, by the way, uh, listed out in the show notes for you guys. So uh, if you want to learn how to bury the key or exhume the key as they call it, it's all there. So you do tomb exhume dash K. You give it the path to where you want the key extracted to. Okay. Then you give it the path to the JPEG file the key is embedded in. So you can see here I'm saying exhume the key to my current directory mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and pull it from golf.jpg, which is located in my documents folder. So I execute that command. It asks me for the password. Right. Now, this actually is a very secure password. I give it that password. It now extracted the key. Now, if I look at my file system, oh, nice. I now have the key. There is the uh, so it kind of gives it away. It's called because I called it disk two dot VDI. Now yeah. you know, right? So now, now that we have that disk two uh, key dot VDI extracted, we can now mount my very secret special tomb. So we use now we just use our standard tomb mount command, which uh, is tomb open. Oops, open. You got to spell open right. Open. And then there's the, I'm saying open this win7disc2.vdi, which is actually my yeah. tomb file, with this key file. And because I have my swap partition mounted, I'm saying go ahead and force. I hit enter. 
I enter my super secret key password, mm -hmm. which is uh, probably way too long for a demo. There we go. And now it mounts it, password OK, and boom, it just mounted it what appeared to be a VDI image, although I don't have, I don't have yeah, write yeah, access yeah. to it because I haven't found it yet. What appeared to be a VDI file is actually my secret tomb that I can stash full of files. And if, if anybody, and I'm thinking like maybe I'm crossing the border to Canada and right. the Mounties on their horses want to go over my bonobo, they would look at this and they would see a bunch of virtual disks and they would see a directory full of JPEGs and they would never be the wiser that in one of those images is potentially thousands of confidential documents. You know, and it's an added pro tip. You could also have, make sure you, in your picture directory you have lots of selfies with Mounties on horses because then you're just full of wind because they're going to be like, well, clearly he's one of us. I mean, clearly. Yeah, so now there's a couple of downsides. Chat room's always already pointed them out. By the way, yep. you could always keep that JPEG on a thumb drive just I was gonna to make say, it even you know, more. Uh, you know, what, if it was me, I would I treat it like the spare key syndrome. So it's like, you know, you have you have the one person that has the spare key for you, the, you know, like a physical key. Um, treat it the same way, I think, you know, to where you have multiple spare keys in multiple locations that are accessible if you forgot three of them, you know, where the fourth one is, that kind of thing. Yeah, you could, right? I would. Now, here's the areas of downside. Okay. I already mentioned one is you're using root a lot when you're doing yeah. this. So not yeah. awesome. you got to have root access to a box. Probably already have that. The second thing I don't love about this process is while I'm doing it, there is key files being left around in my file system. So even though I can now go in here and remove that key file, right, and I still have, I still have the, uh, the JPEG I can go extract it from, while I'm working on it, there's mm -hmm. keys sitting around in my file system. That just seems like a window of risk that's too great, but it's, from a practical standpoint, not insurmountable. It's not, it's not, not like a really, deal breaker. Yeah. I mean, unless, unless you are literally waiting for someone to kick your door in, I don't think it's a risk. I think that if yeah. you're just more concerned about privacy while traveling, um, especially with just some podunk that steals right. your laptop, right. you know. That was my goal. But like, it, whatever, actually, you know. Slaver points out in the chat room, you could also maybe temporarily extract the key to a temp FS. Like I was, be, you get bad. to choose where you extract the key mm -hmm, to. So mm -hmm. you could extract it somewhere temporary, like a RAM disk or something like that. Not bad uh, and uh, they also, um, Tomb has support for post-action scripts. Right. So right. you could also have a little bash file that Tomb calls that just goes and cleans things up immediately for you, okay. maybe with like a secure delete or something. Very interesting. So there is like, uh, oh, oh, and this oh. is also, there's other really neat features to Tomb. Like you can do uh, folder binding. So Ooh. you could have like your some of your .config folders actually live inside oh. Tombs, and when Tomb mounts those uh, volumes, right. it will bind the folders. So you could have some of your config files that are, it's essentially kind of like symlinks so they're called bound folders, mm -hmm. and you could have them live in your tomb, and then you could close the tomb and open the tomb. And uh, when you open the tomb, those applications would have access to their config. And when you close the tomb, those applications would look like they didn't have any configs, which also would be very good for plausible deniability. So, like hypothetically, you have like you're you're, you're like secretly uh, a Justin Bieber guy, right? And your playlist is living <laughs> in this thing, and you do wow. not want anyone to know this stuff because I don't. Obviously, I'm not into that, not even remotely. But you know, just as an example, you got <laughs> oh, some musical band. Right, that you're of course, really, sure, yeah. <laughs> some musical band you're really into. You can a secret. You can basically, you're saying you could bind these uh, playlists and music files to that situation. To that tomb, yeah. Right, and then otherwise it's like, oh no, no, rhythm he's, box. He's, he's a metalhead. You know? Yeah, you could because okay. you don't actually have to. What, what I'm, I guess, what I'm getting at is like, say yeah. you had a um, a playlist directory. You don't have to actually physically move that directory. You could just bind the location of that directory nice. inside the tomb. I like that. So yeah. again, you know, so then when you want to like put on your Justin Bieber wig and you know get your or, uh, get yourself all beavered out, you know, and rock out. You I can, guess so. You can do that. Uh, personally, I wouldn't recommend it, at least not, uh, unless you're in the privacy of your own home. <laughs> not for me. Uh, I guess another <laughs> thing I would like, maybe this isn't necessarily a con, but a, a, an area I would love to see improvement. I actually started this on a quest to integrate my YubiKey. And I wanted to be able to have a passphrase and something I have. And if anybody out there has mm -hmm. found a way to use their YubiKey with Tomb, that would be awesome. And remember, yeah. I think I want to underscore what I like the most about Tomb is that it's just a set of really nice scripts that sit on top of a lot of just standard Linux technology. So really yeah, what Tomb right. is doing is Tomb is creating a loopback device, it's formatting that loopback device with extended four, it's encrypting that loopback device, and it's managing the keys for you, and then it's signing the loopback device and managing the mounting and unmounting for you. That's really what Tomb is doing. Right. But it, it essentially takes 15 steps and makes them two to three steps. You create, you dig the Tomb, 
You create the key, and then you lock the tomb. It's essentially like, a three-step process. Seems like it's, you know, and the reason why it seemed more, and a couple of people comment on this, it seems more complex than it really is, is because we're showing you additional things yeah. you can do with it. Yeah, At the end of the day, it's stuff. three things. Yeah, it really is just three things, and you've, you've replaced TrueCrypt with technology right. that's built into every Linux since kernel 2.6, which is like everything now. Which was versus the alternative, which may or may not be built into... You yeah, know, and have, the other thing is like... The closer you get to the quote-unquote Linux metal, the more eyeballs you have auditing the code, the more people that are improving it. The, like some of the stuff that we're working with is, is industry-grade stuff because there's so many eyes on it. And so many people are involved with the creation of it. And it's been around for years now. So it's like if you're going to move from something like TrueCrypt, you want to move to something that has at least the same amount of lifespan that TrueCrypt potentially had for you. Mm. And basing something on DMCrypt and Lux is a no-brainer because a really, at the end of the day with Tomb, all you're doing is making a loopback device. You can move that pretty much anywhere. So basically, this is taking the existing technologies and making it easy. Boom. Boom. There it is. Boom. Making Boom. it making it something standards-based that you can now make portable and mm -hmm. super mm -hmm. easy to get rolling. So it's Tomb. Links in the show notes, descriptions and guides, step-by-step -step instructions to get it installed. All of that's in there. Also, Stag Hide if you want to use the uh, built-in uh, steganography uh, capabilities, which I, I like recommend. That. That's cool. Yeah, that's all in the show notes so, as well. Ten thousand dollar question, and you know this is based on what I've been following so far. Uh, password. I'm you know I I'm a dummy. Uh, it's like yeah. oh crap, oh crap. What's my, my recommendation you know? for password would be go with a nonsensical sentence. So something that's a whole sentence long, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's like duck staple battery sink purple, right? Make it. I make, make it, love to bacon. Well, that might actually be too close to actual English because it might actually be too close to truth too. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I'm just saying there's always that possibility. I mean, you get a thing full of bacon, things happen. But you know, but something like involving uh, maybe some of your favorite, so something that's a little less uh, logical, something a little yeah. less flowy. Okay. Yeah. Something the computer would be like, what? That doesn't make any sense. And it's really easy, and it turns out it's been built into your Linux box all along. Interesting. We just helped you unlock the potential. So Matt, yes, that's the Linux Action Show's look at a real, legitimate, true crypt replacement. For Linux. Yeah.